This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on December 7th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today we are recording at the fifth giant virus meeting. It's taking place in Tegernsee, Germany, at the Ringberg Castle, which is a really cool castle (laughs) up on a hill (laughs) next to a lake, and we have a lot of snow. It's like three degrees Celsius today outside, and today was beautiful, it was sunny. And we are um, recording in front of an audience full of giant virologists. (laughs) Hello, giant virologists. Hello. (laughs) You know, you would think that giant virologists make more noise than other virologists. (laughs) Uh, And I have two guests for you this evening. It's 8 p.m. Everyone has just had dinner. They've had something to drink, so everyone's relaxed. And uh, we're going to talk for about an hour about the research being done by two people from this meeting. So here are our guests from the French National Center for Scientific Research at the Banyuls Oceanological Observatory. Cherie Yao, welcome to TWIV. Well, uh, thanks. The, Thanks for having I me. got everything right. Yeah, right? that's all right. Because yeah. I asked her, what's your affiliation? And she said, it's, compl- it's a little complicated. Yeah. <laughs> and also, uh, from the Universidad Federal de Minas Gerais, 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 <laughs> Department of Microbiology, Victoria Quiroz. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you very much, Professor. You're <laughs> welcome. Vincent, no professor. <laughs> no, thank you. This is Vincent. Um, And by the way, if you enjoy the work we do on these podcasts, we'd love your support. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. So I would like to start by finding out your histories, like where you're from and where you got educated and and so forth. So Cherie, let's start with you. Okay, so I'm born in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And uh, with my family, we migrated to Sydney, Australia when I was five years old. So I did my whole education in Sydney, Australia, from you know kindergarten, primary school, to my PhD. So I did my uh, undergrad at the University of Sydney. And uh, in Australia, you can do um, kind of like a fast track. You do an honours year, which is a one-year research project. Mm-hmm. And if you get a first-class honours, you can go straight into a PhD. So I did that, but I did my PhD in um, uh, the University of New South Wales, which is also in also in Sydney. So you, when you went to college, you knew you were going to get a PhD. Maybe yeah, I, th- I was always academic. Uh, I went to like a selective school, but I actually am the sort of first intake of a liberal arts style mm. uh, degree. So I was doing anthropology, Spanish, and biochemistry in my first year. So at what point did you you say, I'm going to do a PhD in, well, what was your PhD in? Uh, It was on metagenomics of Antarctic lakes. (laughs) It's a pretty big leap from Spanish and (laughs) anthropology. In the first year, I realized that I'm not really good at anthropology. (laughs) (laughs) I like Spanish, so I actually did a double degree in Spanish, and I did a a year exchange in Mexico. So I, you know, I like I Mm. like traveling. Um, You speak Spanish? Yes, a bit. But now my French is much better. French has taken over the part of my brain devoted to Spanish, (laughs) because yeah, now I'm in France. So, when did you? decide you wanted to do science as a PhD. It must have been before you applied, right? Um, yeah, because I was in a liberal arts degree, you have to sort of choose which discipline. I always liked biology, so that okay. was clear. I didn't, not talented in math. I'm not, um, 
Anthropology. Tell, uh, no, no, not talented <laughs> anthropology or psychology or chemistry. Biology was just fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you said you worked on metagenomics of... Antarctic lakes. Antarctic lakes. Yeah. Did you do some field work for that? Uh, I did it at the end of my PhD. So I always said that I did my whole PhD on a lake that I've never seen with my own eyes. <laughs> <laughs> because the time you do the sampling to the time you get the sequencing. So there's quite a delay. So I never saw this lake, but I'm an expert in this <laughs> lake. Don't tell <laughs> people that. Because yeah. they, they think scientists you know, go and do everything everywhere. Right? Yeah. Now, it really is a privilege to be able to get to go to these places. There, If you want to go to Antarctica as a tourist, you will spend like $10,000 mm. to, to be five minutes and you probably won't touch the land. So I was really lucky. I got to go on ocean voyage, stand on the ice, and yeah, it's fantastic. It's really wonderful. Okay, yeah. so PhD, what did you do after that? Um, I got a, I, I found all of these giant viruses in the lakes, and so then I got the virus bug. I wanted to work on, yeah. on viruses. And um, I saw a postdoc offer in France, where I am now, and uh, I applied for it, and I got it. <laughs> so that's what I did. I went to a uh, postdoc uh, where I've ended up now in a, a permanent position. Van Yules. Yep. And so your postdoc was on what? Same, same thing, giant viruses? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're giant, but the smaller giant viruses. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so got, it. got it. Yeah. And then now you're in a permanent position. Yeah, so I, I managed to be a postdoc in the lab for about five years, and I worked uh, on these algae viruses. And I, I mean, it's the first time I learned to culture mm -hmm. algae and viruses because before I just did metagenomics, so I was just looking at the sequences. And um, I, I did a little bit of a, an Arctic project looking at uh, algae from Arctic. Mm. And um, then I got a, a fellowship, so it's called uh, Juan de la Cierva, it's a Spanish fellowship, and I went across the border to Barcelona for, um, I was there about two years, and before I, I managed to get the permanent position. So a senior rest position, I'm a civil servant, <laughs> I work for the French government, and uh, the way you get in is a lot different from a... Uh, like a, a yeah, university type position. Mm. All right, so you're not affiliated with the university? Uh, no. I mean, we, we are a, a mixed research institute, so there is the university there. The university administers the site, and I have colleagues who work for the university, but I personally get paid from the, the CNRS. Okay. All right, we'll come back to your science. Um, Victoria... Tell us your story. Well, I was born and raised in Belo Horizonte, um, Minas Gerais State in Brazil. And I have a biology degree. And I don't have a master's because I started working with um, arboviruses at first, more like an inflammation background. And then by the end of my studies, like the final year of my biology course, I realized that I didn't have like the environmental um, expertise and in my diploma I, I didn't choose an area like oh I want to work in health area or the like natural stuff like zoology or botanics I just said okay I will do everything and then I realized that I had this but I wanted to keep working with viruses and at the time I was doing Professor Jonathan's course and then I saw giant viruses and I was amazed by this because he had isolated two pen virus the year it was published. To, like, it was the end of 2018, but it was 2018. And then I said, okay, I will have a look in his work. And then I asked for an opportunity in his lab and he accepted me. And then I went straight to the PhD because he suggested, oh, why don't you go to the PhD? And I didn't say no, but I asked him if he was sure about that. <laughs> so he said, yes. And then I said, yeah, and I'm here now. <laughs> so when, when in, in your uh, career, did you get interested in science? Hmm. 
I remember that I used to watch a TV show named Animal Planet, Extreme, Animal. something yeah. like this. <laughs> <laughs> and since I was a kid, I used to play role-playing games with my cousins. And I had this idea about riding a bestiary with all the characteristics every monster would have to have. So mermaids would have to adapt their eyes to see in depths and things like this, because I saw some, I think some ducks have some muscles or something like this. I don't remember right now. But I had this idea, and I knew that I needed to be a biologist to have the knowledge to write this. But then, I think I was 12 when my first teacher taught us about viruses. And then I said, no, I want to work with that, not to, like, I don't want to work with and compare anatomy anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I decided that I wanted to be a microbiologist. And I was more into viruses, but then the video game The Last of Us came out. And then I was like, oh, what about fungi? But no. <laughs> but no, then I had, I remember that I had my first microbiology lesson and I said, okay, definitely microbiology. And I, I started working in the only laboratory in our department in, in UFMG that worked with the three microorganisms just to make sure that which one I wanted to work with. Mm. But then I, then I said, yeah, I want to work. With viruses. What were the three? Bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Yeah. So the last of us didn't win. Huh? No. <laughs> good. That's good. It actually, it's pretty good, right? Yeah. As these things go. And now, so you're, currently you're a PhD student. Yeah. And you're also working, you're not working in Brazil right now, right? No, not now. So I'm, now I'm doing mobility period in Tromsø, Norway. And Actually, when I entered in my PhD, my proposal was to isolate viruses, so do prospection assays. But then the pandemic hit, and then I had to stop working with that. And now that I'm doing my mobility period, I had the opportunity to actually start working with prospection. So now I'm working with prospection there. So your advisor is here, right? Yeah, there Professor is, Gabriel he Almeida. <laughs> and he says right now it's dark all the time, right? Yeah. <laughs> It is. Can you handle that? Yeah, it's. I think I, I got used to it. I, but I got there in the middle of July, so it was like lightness, like the midnight sun. Yeah. And then I find it strange at the time, but then I grew used to like having less and less daylight. And now I, I don't bother actually because I, go, I just go to work and I don't know, I, I don't really see the outside yet. <laughs> and then I go home and I just leave, so yeah. <laughs> so so uh, Gabriel said, it's the northernmost virology lab in the world? The northernmost university. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's pretty good. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to talk about your science as well, but we'll come back. I want to talk with Sh Cherie a bit. So this the metagenomics you did on the um, Antarctic lake, right? Antarctic lakes, yes. Did it have a name? Uh, the, the metagenomics? No, or the, 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 the lake. <laughs> yeah. The lake. Yeah, yeah. So I worked primarily on organic lake. I okay. also worked a bit on ace lake. And I looked a little bit at deep lake. They have names, these lakes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I know organic lake because uh, the work that you did, I teach it in my course, actually. Oh, well, you know, you wrote a blog on... That's how I, I found out about you uh -huh. and, the, and TWIF, because you wrote a really good blog about the paper that we published right. about it. And, uh, yeah, it was really spot on, so I, I appreciate it. Good, thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, you didn't go there much, but you got, you got water samples, and what did you do with them? Yeah, so, the, so I was part of, I don't know if you remember, Craig Venter, yeah. the Global <laughs> Ocean... <laughs> sampling expedition before Tara existed. He went uh, around the world in the um, Sorcerer 2. That was the name, that's the name of his yacht. Mm -hmm. And um, we were affiliated with that. So uh, I, I didn't go on the Sorcerer, but the sampling effort was part of the Global Ocean Sampling Expedition. Uh, so it was, um, so this is in Australian Antarctic Territory. And uh, this region is called um, the Vestfold Hills, and it's what is known as a oasis, 
because it's one of the few places in Antarctica with no ice. So there's actually like rock, bare rock. And uh, so the western tip of Antarctica, the McMurdo Dry Valleys and the Westfold Hills are some examples of these places. And um, because you've got this bare rock, you've got hundreds of little lakes that have, we were just discussing this at dinner, they all have really different microbial communities. And so mm. what's great about these lakes is that there are no animals. <laughs> They're microbial lakes. There's maybe, a, there's a few copepods in some of the lakes. Uh, but it's like you just took away the top of the mm. food chain and you can just really see like um, by elimination mm. who's there and link it better to what what they're doing. So that, that was the big interest in it. And so I, I was at the, the sort of dawn of metagenomics where we still had Sanger sequencing and we had 4-5 sequencing mm -hmm. as well. And by, like when you compare with what the volumes of data now, it's like just nothing. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was really great fun. So you would get samples from these lakes yeah. Sent back to you in Australia, and then you would uh, do uh, um, sequence, <laughs> sequencing on them, correct? So, actually, it was um, my advisor and other postdocs who were there before. Uh, you go there by ship because we don't have an airport. Mm -hmm. uh, McMurdo has an airport. Uh, at the time, the Australian icebreaker is the Aurora Australis, so you, you steam from Tasmania straight down. It's a couple of weeks to get there. Then there's a base, and from the base you've got to go by, uh, I think they go by Hagelands, like these sort of tractor things, or or snow buggies. I wasn't there. So, I, so it was my advisor who went there, and these lakes can be ice covered or free of ice. Mm. If they're ice covered, you just drill a hole. You, get, you pump the water, and like all metagenomics, you you pump the water onto filters, and the microbes are stuck on the filters, and you bring that home. Mm -hmm. And then that's where I came in. I did DNA extractions on those filters. What did you find? Uh, so my first project was uh, to look at organic lake. And organic lake, that sample was just full of giant virus sequences. So we had like just two almost three full genomes just fell out of the assembly mm -hmm. really easily. And then this was that, um, so I was alone in my desk in Australia. There's not many, there's not virologists in the, um, in my, there's one virologist in the department. I think he worked on hepatitis. Um, and I was reading all these papers coming from La Scola, <laughs> like, oh, wow, virophage. And so that's where I could actually because the first virophage was uh, genome sequence and described, I could see it now in my sequence by mm. um, by homology. So, so I found a virophage in uh, the lake. And what did you call it? Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to give it a better name. I just called it organic lake virophage and organic lake phycondovirus. So this where I got in trouble. Apparently, it's a mimi virus, but at the time there was only one mimi <laughs> virus. <laughs> So I thought they were all algal viruses and Mimi virus was odd. And they're probably, I think they're infecting algae. But I don't know because it's just sequences. Right. So you never had a, an isolate system for this virophage and its host? Mm, no, no. But now there are sort of similar ones. So I think we can be yeah. fairly confident that they're sitting in that. Um, group of <coughs> Mimi virus type viruses infecting algae. So in, in many cases, these virophages are also integrated into the host, right? Did you see that? Uh, not at all, because mm. it's very hard to get hosts out of metagenomic sequences. Mm. Especially at that time, we don't have a lot of coverage. You just got scraps of 18S sequences. So just an idea of who could be there, but not like uh, the capacity to see integration. But subsequently, <coughs> has anyone else done the genome of these hosts and found it? 
Uh, well, because we don't know exactly who is the host. Um, hmm. There has been some virophages, well, loads from Chris uh, Bella's work, and that uh, they're coming out of metagenomic sequences and also in the um, cafeteria right. um, genomes that they're if integrated. I, if I remember, then you searched the databases made by the Ventnor crews, right? Yes, And the you databases. found the verophage in some of those as well, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. I just have to say though, mm. I'm out of, I'm a bit out of the virophage game. <laughs> These ones, they don't have an integrase, so I'm not sure they're actually integrated. Mm. I'm not sure if someone has seen one in this, what in the like organic like virophage family that's integrated. But now the world of virophages is more complicated because there's polyntons and polynton virus and. Yeah, I remember at the time when I wrote the post, you had in your paper talked about how. They might protect the host when there's not a lot of light around. Yeah. Right? I thought that was a cool idea for what they did. Yeah, that was really my co advisor's um, idea, Federico Lauro. I had a really Italian sounding lab, so my advisor was Riccardo Cavicchioli. He's Australian. Federico Lauro is Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, he was playing around with these sort of models and I don't know how to do proper modeling, but he's like, just try this program, and you just see that it's, it's, once you have a third party in there, it's a kind of a natural consequence that it's inhibiting the virus, so it's doing something right. to the dynamics. Right. I'm just looking up Cavicchioli. <laughs> yeah, Rick is an expert on Archaea. It's a wine. <laughs> I didn't know it's a wine. But I don't know what it means. Rick is from Gympie. <laughs> no <way>. Really? <laughs> Gympie is a small town in, um, in Queensland. Okay. In anyway, so that was your PhD program, that yeah. project, right? That's right. Okay. Well, let's go over to Victoria for a bit. And um, uh, you, you, as part of your PhD work, did some analysis of Pithoviruses, right? Yeah. Genomics. Uh, there's a paper that you published. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, so that was the idea that we had because I needed to present something for my midterm evaluation, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and there, it was the pandemics, and I didn't have like the results of a like the proposal of my PhD was to prospect the viruses, but we have to stop this. And before the Aquatic Viruses Workshop of 2021, Professor Rodrigo, he invited me to do a, like a collaboration with him to um, perform some pangenomic analysis on chloroviruses. Mm -hmm. So I learned how to do pangenomic analysis with him. And then I realized, oh, I used to work with vermamoeba vermiformis. And then we have like ophiovirus that infects vermamoeba. And it clusters together with pithovirus and cedroviruses. And I thought, oh, they are probably, they can be really different. So mm -hmm. a pangenomic analysis of those three would be a, an interesting thing to look at. And then, <coughs> yeah, we started doing this. And yeah, it was pretty much that. But we thought that, oh, Ophel, Ophel is really like, different, but I'm going to spoil my presentation for tomorrow. <laughs> and yeah, I, I don't know what to say now. <laughs> oh, so you don't want to reveal your talk, is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to. Yeah, but this won't be released for weeks. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, but they will listen. Oh, right, they, I forgot. They will be scrolling on their cell phones <laughs> you know, tomorrow. <laughs> they'll forget by tomorrow. And um, they'll, they'll, you know, yeah. it's never bad to repeat things. Yeah. So what we see is that when we add ophiovirus to the pangenomic analysis, the pangenome, which is the, like all the genomes together, mm. it grows a lot. So the, the pangenome slope is like, it's really high, it gets really high when ophiovirus is added. And the core genome slope goes really down. Mm -hmm. And there are like few conserved. Um, a core, the core genome is really small, is the smallest one that we saw. And the pangenome is not the largest one, but it's really large. And ophiovirus shares less than 
10% of its genes with beta viruses and cell viruses. So it's a really different virus. virus. Yeah. So for listeners who don't know what a pithovirus is, can you explain oh, yeah. it? <laughs> Pithoviruses are um, ovoidal or oblong-shaped virus. The first one was isolated in the permafrost in si Siberia, and mm -hmm. then another one was isolated from um, Russia as well, in, in the permafrost sample. But we have at least more two isolates, one in Japan um, and one in France. 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 <laughs> Sorry. They, they both are right, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so the the particle size is really big compared to the genome size, mm -hmm. and is the same for cedra viruses, but ophioviruses has a bigger genome size, and the particle is is smaller than pithoviruses, but it's a huge particle, like a about one microm micrometers mm -hmm. in length. Yep. And do, they, do we know what the natural host of these viruses is? The natural, no, but we know that they infect amoeba in laboratory. So pithovirus and cedrovirus infect a cunt amoeba, and ophiovirus infect vermin amoeba vermiformis. Do you have any desire to get these viruses and actually infect cells with them? So <laughs> <laughs> I used to work I, I worked a bit with ophiovirus in laboratory, but not pithovirus and cedrovirus, but it would be nice to infect and see the cytopathic effects. I, I like wet lab like experiments. You showed me on your phone a picture of a plaque assay. Yeah, <laughs> that it's was the Beautiful, days. nice. Which virus was that? It was Zika virus. Zika. Yeah. Yeah, Zika makes good plaques. Yeah, <laughs> small one, those. I preferred my my Yaro virus or chikungunya virus plaques were easier to count. <laughs> so, so Victoria showed me a picture on Instagram <laughs> of three stacks of six well plates. It was 24 well plates. 24 well yeah. plates. Because <laughs> we used to have the wall of polio in my office, which was 1,606 well plates, right? Wow. Yeah. So that was a little homage to that, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I can't build, build a wall yet, but yeah. The wall is gone, you know. Oh. When I, I vacated my office, they came and, and tore it down. Oh. Uh, it was all glued, so I said, good riddance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to need to re-drywall. So um, now you're, you're in uh, Norway. Yes. So is, was there a requirement to go to Norway as part of your PhD or somewhere else? Or? So... When we did the proposal, so going straight to the PhD isn't a common thing in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Usually people do the master's first. But when we did a, like my proposal, we proposed this collaboration with P Professor Gabriel. And it was like a strong point for me to get in the PhD to do this collaboration with him. So it was kind of... We, but I, I thought this mobility period would be earlier in my PhD. But I had to wait for the pandemic to, right. like, yeah, <laughs> things get better and things were terrible in Brazil. So, yeah. yeah we so, had to wait a while. what are you doing there in uh, Tromso? I'm now I'm doing prospection finally. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we collected samples and then I had to adapt a little bit the protocol because the amoeba grow different than back in Brazil, and I never had like the I didn't have the experience of working with the Cantamoeba cells, just Verma amoeba ones, and they kind of behave different in culture. So we adapted the protocols, and then I started trying to isolate some viruses. And I realized that I bumped into the same mistakes that the guys back in, <laughs> in Bradford did, because in August I saw a well, and I thought, I wrote, oh, it's contaminated. But then, just last month, I realized that it was a Mimi virus, not a bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it took me three months to think, oh, this might be a virus, actually. <laughs> so Bradford was, is a reference to the original <laughs> Mimi virus, right? Yeah, like the Bradford caucus, because yeah. they thought it was like bacteria. Which they thought it was a bacteria, and then they stuck in the freezer for 10 years. Yeah, at least it took me only three months to realize. <laughs> so you are infecting amoeba with viruses now, right? Yeah. Well, n now, yes, because I was preparing these talks and <coughs> trying to do some um, sequencing. Right. 
but we don't have, and I did microscopy sections, of course. So w what does this virus look like? Is it, uh, does it look like a pithovirus? Does it have icosahedral? It's pseudo-icosahedral with yeah. a lot of fibrils. And mm -hmm. we also isolated some Marseille virus, as it seems, because we have some data of sequencing, but not the whole genome yet. So Marseille virus are more tiny, but still giant, around like 200 um, nanometers. Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of vesicles during the replication cycle, which was already described for Marseille virus. And the Mimi virus, like, because we don't have the sequence yet, is really a Mimi virus, like. <laughs> and we see, like, the both, um, both areas of the viral factory with the viral factory where the particles are assembled and the acquisition of fibrils part. And we really do see, like, the, the steps of the cycle. Mm -hmm. So I think when we sequence, it will. The sequence will tell you what yeah. it is. By the way, where did you sample this from? This was actually Professor Gabriel that collected the samples for, for, for those two, and it was around Trumsa. But one Marseille virus, probably, it was in Lufoten Islands that we collected this it sample. This seems to be a theme that you work on things that other people have collected. Yeah, your advisor <laughs> yeah. collects the samples. <laughs> so they get to travel, right? <laughs> yeah. So when are you returning to Brazil? I'm know? returning probably in the first week of January. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I have some other things I want to ask you, but let's go back to Cherie now. So you start your own lab and, and you're working on these unusual um, algae. Tell us about those. Yeah, so I have to say, I'm kind of integrated into our lab, so I didn't have to start my lab in the way of, like, I have to buy all the equipment <laughs> and I have to <laughs> measure out the spaces. So that's really great. I kind of, um, it's a really collaborative group. So I'm working on mainly on Ostracoccus, which is sort of became famous or was famous as being the smallest free-living eukaryote. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a little green algae, but it's just the size of a bacterium. It's a one micrometer cell. So it's really great because it's a grow in a lab and uh, it's kind of a model for, for plants, for eukaryotes. We'd like to make it into like the yeast of the sea. So. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Make it? Do you mean as well, a like a model? A model. Because there's, you know, there's so few model organisms. Yeah, like, yeah, sure. So we wanted to. So in algae, it's normally chlamydomonas, but this is a marine, uh, a marine species that you can. They were originally isolated or from uh, near our lab. So in front of um, the lab, we have the bay, a beach, and sort of. Further north, we have different lagoons, mm. and it was originally isolated from one of these lagoons. So it's still there's kind of that theme of um, lagoons being a bit more of a special environment. And, um, and it was sort of fairly recent, so it was Nigel Grimsley who hired me on that first project, who isolated viruses of Oshukokus. And they're really abundant. So they come up with all the metagenomes. Mm. We're super lucky if you just grab some water, you put it on a culture. I think you have a really high success rate of getting um, mm. viruses isolated on them. So we can have collections of <laughs> viruses, too many viruses that we can't manage to keep them. <laughs> keep so them sort of where, where are the Ostreococcus? Yeah, Ostreococcus. Is it globally uh, found? Yeah, it's globally distributed. There's a few species. The one we're working a lot is more of a coastal species. There are others that are more open ocean. They tend to be this low abundance little mm -hmm. green balls. <laughs> so they're green algae. They yeah. do photosynthesis, right? Yeah, they do photosynthesis. And what's the name of the virus that that was found in your lab? So they're part of the genus Prozinovirus. And so we call them Ostrococcus viruses, Ostrococcus story viruses. So they'll be OTV one, two, three, or uh, much bigger numbers. We try to make 
bigger numbers to mm. keep <laughs> a handle on it. So, so the, in the lab, the, you can grow the algae, right? Yeah, you can grow them. And then you can put virus on and it infects them. And you can do plaque assays. Oh, I was going like to ask, that's yeah. what I was getting to. <laughs> so you can make a monolayer of the algae? Uh, it's not a monolayer. No. You actually, they only grow on semi-solid media, so we have to use agarose, they don't like agar. Uh -huh. And you incorporate the cells by mixing it in the agarose and you pour it. And um, even the viruses, we sort of incorporate it in the agarose and then pour them out. So the plaques are really tiny. It's the only plaques that I've ever looked at, so it's normal. To so the, the cells are green. Yeah. With little plaque holes in them, right? Yeah, yeah. That reminds me holes. of it's exactly like virus. Jim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he had a nice monolayer with big plaques in it. Right? If you let them grow longer, the plaques will get bigger. So you should make a wall of <laughs> for sinovirus. <laughs> it's actually really hard to see the plaques properly. Okay, all right. But, uh, yeah. So the the virus kills the cell. Yes. Yeah, so as far as we know, they're strictly lytic viruses. They even though they might have traces of these presinoviruses in, um, in green algal genomes. So there's a big paper about how there's lots of viruses in green algae. It's not part of their life cycle. Like they're not temperate. They mm -hmm. don't integrate and pop back out like, um, uh, like ectocarpus virus. <laughs> but the yeah. integration is an accident then? I believe so. I think mm -hmm. that just occasionally there's integration events I, I've never seen it as part of the life cycle of the virus. It's not an integrase mm -hmm. gene Got it. to do that. Is this virus a, a considered a giant virus? I consider it a giant <laughs> virus. The particle size, so the classic icosahedra. Uh, is that the plural of icosahedra? Yeah, okay. Uh, they're about 120 nanometers across, double-stranded DNA genomes of around 200 kb. So they're pretty small for giant viruses, but I've seen posters that now you have mimi viruses that are 75 kb <laughs> genome, so that's tiny. <laughs> so really, if you're going to start like not including these, those ones, if you're going to say 400 kb genome is a cutoff, well, you've just got and eliminated all your new viruses. Then they can't come to this meeting. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say anyone that's in the... I would have said before, any of the former NCLDV or nucleosidoviricota are giant viruses, but now apparently there's this virus virus. Maybe we can include them in the giant virus. We had a little argument about nucleosidoviricota today, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, does it mean anything? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we had some differing opinions. Oh, that's another podcast. So you can infect in the lab your ho your your uh, <coughs> the you call the the algae they're pico eukaryotes right That's yeah yeah they're pico eukaryotes and so I forgot to say they're called presinoviruses right because it used to be that all of these small green algae were called presinophyte okay uh, but now so if there's fighting in the taxonomy <laughs> of viruses uh, other protists have huge reforms also in their taxonomy and presinophyta does not exist okay. They are. They are the <laughs> Are there any virophages involved with your virus of the I've algae? never seen them, hmm. and um, I don't believe so, because I think the virophages need to have a virus that has a more cytoplasmic lifestyle, that has uh, RNA polymerase. I didn't really think that myself. Matthias said, oh, yeah, but I think that's the okay. case. Like, okay, yeah, I can see that. I agree. So if that's true, then the, vir the true virophages should really only be associated with viruses that have a, uh, a more cytoplasmic mm -hmm. um, replication. And yours is nuclear? Well, we don't really know, but you have to assume it because they don't have their own RNA polymerase. Mm -hmm. Maybe they do some Marseille virus magic and they open the genome, uh, the nucleus, and they make the transcription factors come out. But um, we hypothesize that they should have a nuclear phase. I can't think of but a virus. But then they should assemble in the cytoplasm. I can't think of a virus that does that, that pulls the polymerase out of the nucleus. Usually they go in there or have their own in the cytoplasm, right? 
Well, that was sort of, if I understood right, from the Marseille viruses or the Medusa viruses seem to somehow pull them out of the nucleus. Open up okay. the nucleus, but I don't know if that's what's really happening. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, you'd, you'd publish some work which suggests that some cells are resistant to infection. <coughs> yeah. So that's been a big line of, that's what I got hired to work on in the beginning, and I'm coming back to that. Uh, yeah, if you, you infect the culture, and within a few days, at least by the end of the week, you see the culture lies, so it's green, it's not green anymore, it's sort of clear, and by the end of the week it's come back to be green. Mm. And it's really, it's almost deterministic, like you can, I can do this ten times in a row and I, I see it come back. And if you take those green cells and reinfect them, do they get infected? No, they don't. They don't. You can clone them and it stays like that for quite a while, mm -hmm. it's quite stable. Uh, I tried to just keep resistant cells that I diluted, so I removed the viruses, and I just transferred them mm -hmm. for like nine months before I saw a line that stopped being resistant. So it's quite a stable resistance. So this is a big thing that I'm trying to uh, work out how is it working. Is it genetically controlled? So there's a genetic component. Mm -hmm. So what we saw was that uh, lines of algae that become resistant and that we clone them, so we just start from a single cell again, they tended to have big changes in a single chromosome. Mm. And so there's a genetic component. Um, but then we've also done transcriptomics and it's, there's also um, changes in expression. <laughs> and a lot of it is really seems to have this special, like we're calling immunity chromosome or mm -hmm. resistance chromosome, where a lot of the functions involved or seem to be involved in resistance are all in one spot in the genome. But exactly how it works, I'm yet to work that out. So but, that's a spoiler. <laughs> are you going to talk about this? Yeah, so that's what I was going to talk about in the, the conference. Okay, so you have the sequence of this piece of chromosome, right? Yes. It's no virophage in there, right? No. It's something else. And you probably have, have some ideas by looking at the genes and what they encode, right? Yeah, so there are a lot, to do, a lot of genes to do with um, sugar modification. Mm. And there's also some uh, transposons, so transposable elements, bits of DNA that can jump around. So maybe that's what's responsible for the rearrangements. Um, but there's a lot of genes, <laughs> so mm. I kind of thought it would be a scenario like with um, the first bacteriophages, the way they found resistant colonies, they just, um, you know, would put a lot of viruses, they would find a colony that was resistant, and then you sequence it, and it had a point mutation, and it was the receptor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought would happen. That's not what happened at all. So it was, it's not that easy. It's not just like a yeah. one tiny mutation. Is there a receptor for the virus? We don't know what it is. Does someone know what it is? <laughs> no. But uh, there must be one. But. Well, isn't there a cell wall around the algae, or is it just a membrane? I don't know. Uh, so these algae, they don't have a thick cell wall. It's not really visible. So yeah, it's true that plant viruses, they don't really, I guess they don't have a receptor no. because they enter mechanically. Yeah. And so algae viruses are really different from plant viruses. The most common are DNA viruses, and, um, and mm. they look like they have a more bacteriophage mode of entry because they attach to the outside, they empty their contents inside the, yeah. the cell. Okay. So, um, so you have to figure out where in this million bases yeah. the, can you cut pieces out? Do you have the ability in this, in this <coughs> algae to cut specific pieces out? So I'm working on it. Mm. For the moment, we can introduce DNA and overexpress genes. So this is a, a, a work in collaboration with um, Asafari's lab that uh, we pick some genes, we're trying to overexpress them and see if that right. um, affects the infection. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, my big dream would be to get uh, a good knockout system working and 
cut out these Can trees. you use CRISPR? In, in yeah, the... so that's what we're trying to do. Okay. Almost there. Hopefully it'll work. You could do it by homologous recombination. Mm -hmm. So that has been reported, but I haven't had much success. It's really low efficiency, and this chromosome is full of repeated sequences. So I'm, it might happen, but it's not going to be easy that way. Do you still work in the lab yourself? You know, I I do. Not as much as I would like, but yeah. Okay. Uh, Victoria, uh, you have published a paper about an educational kit for virology classes. Tell us yeah. about that. So this was really nice, actually, because I remember that before I asked Professor Jonathan's deposition, I was doing his course, and the, the class that we would see, Tupan virus particles, it was on the day of my birthday. So I was super excited. I was like, oh my God, first time seeing a viral particle with my own eyes, and it will be the best birthday gift ever. But then it, it was on a Wednesday, I think, and he delayed this course for two days after, so it wasn't my birthday gift anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I took it personally. <laughs> Just kidding. So, but it was really nice because you can actually see, and I think for elementary school, it would be nicer because I remember that I was interested in viruses, but I couldn't really imagine them. Of course, I mm -hmm. could imagine bacteriophages, but I thought bacteriophages were like the morphology of kind of all viruses would be something like this. And then, but I, I didn't know about the diversity of morphology shapes as we saw here today as well. And then we have, we had this idea about doing like slides um, and co with cover slips and everything like that, like the kit and fixate mm -hmm. them because then you can distribute to a school and it's like a, cheap material to produce, it's safe, because sometimes you don't teach virology because, because of like safety measures mm. that you have to have, or the cost. And we thought about doing this and distributing and seeing and using, but again, the pandemic <laughs> mm. didn't allow us to really use. But some, some um, courses in our university, we use this to teach. And it wasn't me, it was the, the other PhD student at the time, Gabriel. He used the slides and he, he, like, he said that the students are really, like, were really excited about mm -hmm. this and everything like this. So what we did was we purified the viral particles, the giant viral particles. We stained it with um, um, violet crystal? Crystal violet. Crystal yeah. violet, mm -hmm. yeah. And then, yeah, we waited for it to um, get dry, and then we put it the cover slip, mm -hmm. and that's pretty much what we did. But we also did some um, covers, um, some cover slips of PEC, of um, clinical impo clinically important viruses, because in like school books and everything like this, you just see viruses causing diseases, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's more interesting to like people see like oh what they do to cells so you see that oh this is a plague this is a... so we thought about this and we also did like this was more challenging because we had to get lucky to do but to see like the viral factory mm -hmm. or the inclusion body of mm -hmm. um, pox viruses so yeah but but this these lights were more harder to to do because we have to get lucky to, in a cover slip, have like the specific time point of infection that you can see the viral factory yeah. and stain it properly. But we could do one kit, we couldn't reproduce, do more kits and distribute yet, but I think Professor Jonathan has mm -hmm. like this, this thing as a open project still. Right. Yeah. What, what age kids are? Is, is this for? What age? Yeah, like what grade? Yeah, I, well, I think it depends on the teacher or the professor mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I used it, not, not this, but a pilot in university and I was excited about this. Right. And, but I think that even like child, like eight years old maybe, mm -hmm. they could 
they could use it and even like high school I, I think any age actually so mm. yeah the earlier you teach kids science the better, the better right yeah and we did like a supplementary material to teach the teachers how to use the slides and also teach the kids like how to interpret yeah. what they are seeing yeah. so yeah so you, there's a paper uh, published the vi virology virus goes viral it's at virology journal yeah. 2020 which describes this right yeah. Is this something you would like to do in the future? Yeah, this would be cool because <laughs> <laughs> I really like um, teaching and mm -hmm. having contact with um, students and the questions they make. But sometimes I get a little bit anxious because I remember that I was um, doing this training because in PhD in Brazil, you have to have like teaching experience. So you follow some class, some practical classes. Mm. And I remember that I chose the medicine class and we were using like a flame to do the experiments and the girl burned her hair. Yeah. And I said, okay, maybe, maybe I don't fit for like <laughs> teaching practical lessons maybe because I was more nervous than the girl. Yeah. <laughs> but when, yeah. when are you uh, finishing your PhD? Next year, probably, okay. yeah, in the beginning. And what are you gonna do next? So that's the first time in my life I have to have a plan B because <laughs> opportunities in Brazil, we don't have a lot of opportunities in Brazil in the academical field. Mm. And growing up, I always knew that I wanted to do a PhD and I never had a plan B. But then by the end of your PhD, you start thinking a lot mm. of options. But I was um, recently accepted as a postdoc in Fiocruz, Minas Gerais. So I will work with antivirals there for, I don't know how long, but in Brazil we have like this, um, this kind of rule that if you spend like six months abroad with the Brazilian government, like the founding agencies paying you to be abroad, you have to go back to Brazil and stay six months there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, at least for those six months, I know what I'm doing. Okay. Yeah. Cherie, uh, what do you tell a non-scientist why you should be interested in these tiny algae and the viruses that infect them? Oh, yeah, so we do the science fair, so, um, and the, the big thing about algae, especially marine algae, is to say, well, half of the oxygen you breathe is coming from mm. microbes. It's not just plants, and they're a really important part of... Um, carbon cycle, like this is what's making the, the world go around. Right? And the viruses, well, because they're killing them, they're, they're part of knowing the eco mm -hmm. ecosystem. You have to know, you know what's making them sick, just like uh, how you have to know what's making us sick, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay. Yeah, they have the... So they make a lot of our oxygen. Yeah. That's, I think that... Most people would get that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's one of the... Most people of, think trees and plants make most of the oxygen. Yeah, well, it's true, they're making some of it. Not, yeah. not as much as algae, right? Well, the great oxygenation event was cyanobacteria, yeah. so like it came first from right, but, microbial but, life. Microbial life is the base of life. Yeah, right? but today still, it's, it's a significant amount, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good thing to tell people. Okay, uh, I have... Two more questions, one for each of you. Um, Cherie, what would you have done if you hadn't been a scientist? Oh, maybe I'd be a linguist. <laughs> Not an anthropologist. <laughs> I kind of realize I'm misanthropic. I'm like, oh, you actually have to get along well with people to do anthropology mm, and write okay. essays. Right. <laughs> I wasn't very good. <laughs> linguist. Okay, that's a good yeah, one. Yeah, I like languages too. I haven't heard that answer yet. That's good. <laughs> Victoria, what about you? I mean, you're early on your career, but still, you've yeah. made the decision. What would you have done? Yeah, I don't know. I never had a plan B, actually. So I think I would just be the weird unemployed cousin, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me repeat that. The weird unemployed cousin? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Okay. All right. 
Okay, that's a special episode of TWIV recorded at the Giant Virus Meeting at Ringberg Castle in Tegernsee, Germany. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to TWIV at microbe.tv. You'll find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. And as I said before, if you enjoy our work, all these other podcasts, we have nine total podcasts in different areas of science. We'd love your support, microbe.tv slash contribute. My guest today uh, from the Banyuls Oceanological Observatory, Cherie Yao. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And next year, you are organizing the Aquatic Virus Workshop, right? Yes. It's not next year. It should be the year after. 2020. And you're invited. Five. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> 2025 in Banyuls. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll come and do a TWIV. Because we were there in, in Quebec City earlier this yeah, year. Yeah, right? and you've never been to Banyuls. Nope. Where is that? It's in the south of France. We're really close to the border with Spain. We have a wine. We have a beach. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think you're going to make it, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Aquatic virus meeting. Look for that in 2025. Victoria Kiraz from the Universidad Federal de Minas Gerais. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. <laughs> and good luck with plan B. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love, what is it? My weird unemployed cousin. That's great. <laughs> That's great. You're like I'm, scientists or no job. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's good. I like that. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, Jolene for the timestamps, and Matthias and Thomas, the organizers of this meeting, for having TWIV here again. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Woo!